All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Dina and Don Ortiz, who are in equally sunny Arizona. How are you doing? Yes. Hi, folks. How's everybody doing? Yeah. And uh, Dean and Don are speakers, authors and workshop moderators, global award winning entrepreneur, entrepreneurial leadership experts. And they deliver a message of how to guide and lead success in dynamic environments. And let's face it, over the last couple of years, you couldn't have a more dynamic environment uh, if you actually tried to create it from, from scratch. Right. So, the, so the challenges have been there. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is keeping clients coming back for more. So this, this is a subject like people know, okay, it's easier to sell more to a customer or cost less to sell more to an existing customer, acquire new business, all of that. But companies tend to focus on the new business aspect and celebrate that more than focusing on the customers and keeping customers coming back. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I'll tell you, uh, John, Don and I, um, our, our foundational customers are who have kept us alive during the pandemic. And even now as things are starting to open up and they really are, it's our foundational customers that are keeping us going, keeping us, uh, our musicians working, keeping our business going. So you absolutely have to have a combination of both. But yeah, your foundational customers are, are really your, your root, you know, the root of the business. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think anybody who was only paying lip service to, because let's face it, every company says we're customer centric and most of them even have it on their website, but your experience tends to be very different. It's true, uh, especially during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of us had to pivot and turn our businesses and figure out how to refunnel our product line or business connection. How do you reinvent yourself? And, and without sounding old uh, and making yourself also valuable. That, that was a big thing. How do you make your product or yourself valuable in that, that term? In that dynamic environment. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, I was gonna Go say, we've been, we've been through a lot in our careers. I mean, you know, we've been in the front of war zones, we've been lost in Afghanistan. And so we've learned pretty quickly how to move through dynamic environments. So this was a challenge. COVID was definitely a challenge, but so was a great recession because we're in the entertainment mm -hmm. business. And when you're going through yeah. a recession, entertainment yeah. is the last, things, last thing that corporations buy. For sure, for sure. Well, actually, I was I was looking back a while ago, and I was thinking as we were discussing before I came on air. I came here to the states uh, during the dot com, so I've been through the dot com implosion, nine eleven, the financial crisis, the pandemic. So it seems to me is like we can expect every couple of years some kind of disruption. Yeah, so so you so you have to be ready to you know as you said, number one, holding on to your customers, but also you know, really look at how do you sustain customers during, uh, you know, during upheavals. Yeah, and I think the way that we do that, one of the ways that we do that is, first of all, I think in today's environment, especially, you have to be authentic. You have to have a relationship with your customers. They, they want authentic relationships. They don't want to be sold to. Uh, they want you to give them and help them um, meet their needs. And you do that, at least we do it, Tom does it by um, giving him his background, his information to make sure that an event goes smoothly. And he's got a ton of that. He's been at this for 35 years. So there's a lot of nuances that he can share before, during, and after. A lot of uh, salespeople forget about the afterwards. Make sure that you're going back after the event um, to you know, kind of debrief, see what went right, see what needs to be improved. And that seems to have kept us going. And, and you know, also, and that's also the moment that they're also saying, you know, we're thinking about coming back next you know, April or whatever, and they're already providing a date. They want to move forward. They want to definitely close that already. So a lot of our clients are booking two years in advance to a year in advance. And for us, it's always about being 120 days out, at least already booked in advance. So it's creating that, that funnel. And through our long-term clients, we've been able to do that again and again. And then those are the ones that also refer you to new clients because there's a trust bond already there. Like Dina yeah. said, you don't have to resell your product or your company or what you're able to provide as a great experience to your client. And it is important, and you know this, um, John, to provide an excellent product because in the end, if you don't, 
all the prepping, all the sharing of information is not going to make any sense because in the end, because we sell B2B, we sell to corporations, yep. we are a representation of that brand. And so yep. we have to be excellent all the time. If we make a mistake one time, we don't come back. There's too many options out there for clients to choose from nowadays. And sometimes you're also representing somebody else along that pipeline. So, you know, you're also uh, providing a service for their brand and trust bond as well. So sometimes there's many people in that pipeline. So you're servicing a whole line of people just to get one product across. And that, that you have to understand all those protocols and etiquettes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that you just touched upon there is, is, let's face it, today we live in a world where at least perceived by most customers in a lot of products and services, they say, well, they're all the same. And it's easy to switch now, especially if you're in a, if you are a SaaS business or whatever, it's very, very easy to, to switch. So you have to look at, OK, yes, you have to have the, the excellent product, but also what else? makes you special what else connects you to the customers so kind of i know you were saying you know the unique differences that support distinct competencies could you talk a little bit about that right so for myself and for don because we offer a service we provide live music to corporate events corporate mm -hmm. entertainment. for us it's actually the unique attributes of our team and team of musicians my attributes as a musician and a singer don's attributes as a guitar player we hone our talents so that our talent is excellent and so that's something that you want to do if you're also working with the sales team is you want to make sure that that, those, that talent is honed in. And based on each person's talent, you can then come up with that differential benefit um, that will make you unique. Because remember, service is something different with each person who provides it. It's a little bit different experience. So making sure that they're trained, making sure that they're honing their talent to the best of their ability, that means continually to get trained on. I still go to class. Don still goes to class, not only in terms of being a musician, but in terms of our business. I just uh, took a course at MIT for data analytics because I know that I need that for marketing within my business. So I'm continually honing that, that talent, that education, and then I bring that into my business. And that really does give me the differential benefit that we, that we talk about in the book. Yeah, and like Dina said, we're also reading the event in live time, mm -hmm. in real time as it's happening. So a lot of groups might provide a set list. Uh, we've never used a set list in 32 years. We read the event in real time. So we're right. creating the event experience right now. And that is really important to the client, um, you know, because no two clients are the same and neither do, are the, the experiences yeah. now or the audience. Exactly. And so providing that kind of essence in real time, because we can play so many different genres, we read the age group. The, the feel of the room, uh, the temperature of the room, all of that makes really, you know, big sense, whether you're playing knives and forks music or it's time to be the party band. We yeah. literally, give you an example, John, we literally just did a huge event for um, University of Arizona, one of the, the um, uh, fraternities, yeah, where it was parents, same family day. And we're talking about this huge event of rock and roll. And, you know, it was a frat party, basically, with parents invited. <laughs> And then Monday night, we were at the Phoenician, which is a very high-end resort uh, for, a, for a client that had a healthcare company, where it had to be a completely different approach, very sophisticated music. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to read that crowd and make those adjustments quickly. And I think you have to do that in sales, too. Oh, 100%. I want to ask you who was better behaved, the students or the parents, but uh, the frat party. That is a great <laughs> question. <laughs> and I bet, you I, know, I bet you I know the answer to it, too. I guess anyway. you do. <laughs> Yeah. Surprisingly, yeah. the students were awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but coming back to that point that you just made a moment ago is is that uh, is tailoring that experience, but being able to, as you were saying, Tom, being able to read the room, the temperature, looking at all of this. Um, some people have struggled with that a little bit over the last while because a lot of this has moved virtual, like selling has moved virtual. But you can still you can still achieve that even in a virtual environment. Absolutely. Um, we know that because we have spoken all over the world during this pandemic, uh, and and it's been incredible uh, the insights that we've also received from guests and hosts like yourself, and uh, it's opened up a great new world and and new connections. Yeah, being able yeah. to see people using online platforms, whatever that platform is really helps us connect in a way that we have not been able to previously with email but because before this happened it was always email 
and maybe a phone call if you could connect your time zones. But with Zinc, in fact, we just did a event in Tunisia and it was wonderful to be able to connect with our Tunisian uh, uh, prospective buyers in this format, right? We could laugh, we could see each other, we could create that warm effect that you can't always do on a telephone. Yeah. And what's funny though is that, uh, especially at the beginning, I think uh, there's a there's a section of salespeople who really resisted the the camera. You know, there were people who were great in person, but uh, but when you put them in front of a camera on on Zoom, they suddenly were like, "Oh, I don't really like this." And it and I think there were some of them who were reluctant because again, they thought, "Well, this is probably for a month or two, and then everything will go back to normal." So here we are, two years later. I think that to your point. There's such a great, it, it really does make a massive difference when you collect, connect visually with the other person, when they can see you, when they can see you're actually engaged with them. And 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 there's there's such a trust building there right out of the gate. Yeah, no doubt. I was going to say too, um, the great thing about this uh, platform is that this is an opportunity really, you have to think of it from a foreign standpoint. We certainly do. So when you do make these calls, you need to make sure that you're on your game, just like you would be if you were in person. And think of it that way. Make sure your background is good. Make sure that you're presentable. Um, just as if you, if you were going to a networking event, it's the same, really the same approach. Yeah, and the other thing you touched on there, and, and it's sorry, just it, it, it's a it's a it's a pet peeve of mine actually, but um, you you touched on the education piece and. I, I always say, I know people probably invest a lot of time and money on their hobbies, right? They've no problem paying coaches to, you know, to get their tennis game or their golf game better or whatever, but investing in their own professional development for the yes. thing that puts bread on the table. Yes. Most people don't do that. Yeah. And they really need to, I, I'm an educator. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of that. And I, and I just my own personal story, you know, I started as a street musician, literally busking in front of Ripley's Believe It or Not in San Francisco. And I moved to San Diego. We talked about that and started my uh, first country rock band. We, were, we won a um, state award uh, recognition. We had an um, agent pick us up out of Minnesota. And Minnesota, the agency in Minnesota actually started training us so that we knew how to be good performers, not just good musicians, but good performers. Um, we actually got taken um, in about 1993 from an agent. And we had somebody invest in us. And the agent took most of the money. And I swore that was never going to happen to me again. So I went back and got my MBA. And once I started getting my MBA, it was like, here is this theoretical information that I could apply to real life. And like this whole door opened up and things just started going. I mean, it, our income just started improving tenfold. So absolutely get your education. It can be formal, it can be informal, but go and get your education. And because we work in IT environments now and sales, you have to keep it up. As, yeah, you have to constantly grow and learn. I, uh, yeah. and be educated about it and want that it's a yeah. desire and it's a have to today it's a lifelong learning process you don't if you're going to stay in business it's lifelong learning i tell my students i have a doctorate in business and it's not enough because things are constantly changing so yeah. last year i went to mit and i got a professional course in data analytics it's sure we probably will be going back and doing some work in social media i get social media all day long but there's all these nuances that are constantly coming yeah. out that support sales. And so I need to know what those nuances are. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great, and it's a great example for people out there, uh, you know, getting, continuing to educate yourself. And something you mentioned a moment ago is, uh, you know, you were proficient musicians, uh, but you're the, the agent or whatever, uh, helped you learn how to be performers too and I think that's a that's a key here also for for salespeople because you can be very proficient and knowledgeable about your product and service but when you're engaging with somebody it is somewhat of a performance because you were trying to connect with them and just spouting the you know the features and benefits isn't going to do it no especially <laughs> in today's market and especially what we have found is when you're working with millennials so, and that's a huge buying group now. I mean, it's 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 uh it's the up and coming buying group. Um, they've got more power than they've ever had in terms of buying products and services, and they don't want to be sold to. They want to create an authentic relationship with you, and they want sort of a storytelling approach. That's what we use. So this is where we are. This is where we came from, and this is how we can service your needs. Right? We yeah. want to make we want to make the best experience for you and your clients. And it's a lot of Texan. You know, so it's a different platform that you're dealing with and you have to know what your client's best communication is. You know, today there's so many different platforms. How do you operate with each client? You have to have that question up front. 
So you yeah. understand what's a better way to communicate. Do you like to be emailed? Do you like to Zoom? Do you like to be text to because you're a person who's in constant meeting or traveling? Uh, you know, how do you like to respond and communicate? It's you must ask that and make sure that's upfront today with the new yeah. client, the older client, uh, when they switch you know, gave uh, the guards at the gate as it be today, because a lot of people are moving to different industries and they take you with them. Mm -hmm. So what is the best way to communicate with your client today? And it could yeah. be multiple platforms because oftentimes we have to communicate more than once, right? We know that. We know it takes about 15 times for a new client to even recognize you or a prospective yeah. new client to even recognize you. So what are those platforms so that you don't wear them out? Yeah, and I, lo I love that you raised that point uh, about the about the communication because um, I was I was doing an interview a while back with a with a sales consultant and he was doing it was pre pandemic he was doing a ride along with a, with a salesperson and one of the sales people uh, the salesperson their prospect texted them uh, just a question simple question and the salesperson immediately called them back. And it was an awkward conversation. And after it was over, the, 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 the sales consultant turned to him and said, why did you call him when he texted you? Why didn't you text him back with the answer and say, do, you need to, do we need to jump on a call for more? Because he texted you showing you how he wanted to communicate and you communicated with him totally differently. That's so true. Right. That is exactly. so true. You have to be aware. Aware and yeah. respectful. Yeah. And I mean, it's simple. You, you, there's a simple thing you can always ask, right? It's quite simple. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, let me say, too, on, on the other end, for those, um, for those buyers, especially millennial buyers um, that are buying from sales teams, it's okay to say no. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think um, that particular demographic has trouble saying no, but it's okay to say no, because for us, when you say no, that just means, okay, that's a check mark. We move on to the next client and we're able to put closure on it. Or we've gone a different direction or, you know, make that communication of closure, of professional mm -hmm. closure, or so we can continue, like Dina said, to move forward onto something else. Because we don't want to keep bothering you if this, if our particular product or service is not the right fit for you. We're fine with that. Yeah. But as salespeople, we have to, we have to put closure so that we are able to move on. And sales, although certainly the responsibility falls on us as the people that are selling, but it is a two-way street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's actually, it's one of the things I know it, the salespeople, um, you know, get quite upset about these days is the lack of feedback. It's, you know, you can engage with somebody and then they just go completely silent as opposed to what oh, you're yeah. saying. Yeah, it's it's just, call it ghosting. Just, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Ghosting. And and instead of just saying, well, you know, the timing's not right or, uh, yeah, we decided this isn't the fit for it. Or, yeah. or whatever, just it doesn't matter as long as you just like you know a little bit of closure would go a long way. So for buyers out there, and we're all buyers, is you know, I know we're we're probably all guilty of it. I'm certainly, I'm sure I am, but we should we need to do a better job of actually letting salespeople know when we're not interested, so that so to your point, they can move on. Exactly, and in our point, a lot of time we do have another buyer that wants us for that particular date. Right. So it would be great to move forward and actually close that contract with somebody that's willing to buy your product and finish up. And, and, and uh, that's really important. And another, um, another uh, position to think about too, from a buying standpoint is even if a particular product or service isn't the right product or service, by shutting that door and ghosting, you never know when you might be able to utilize that really good product or service again. And when you've shut the door like that, there's no room for down the road to create a relationship. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes you, you might make a decision on something based on we're seeing a lot of people making decisions based on money right now, as cheap yeah. as they can possibly get it. That might be fine right now as people are starting to get back into the workforce and starting to get back into sales. But in the end, it really is the product and the value that the product brings. And oftentimes getting the cheapest is not always the best approach. Um, yeah. And they often find that out. And then when they get the product and it's not what they wanted, they've already shut the door to a product that might have been uh, appropriate. So again, just don't shut that door. Keep that door open, both on the buying and the selling, because you never know. Yeah, yeah. We, we see that a lot, actually, people who buy the, on, the, on our CRM side, people who buy cheaper, lesser products and then come back later to, to, right. to change when they realize that it's not going to meet their needs. One of the other things that you touched upon earlier was 
uh, the, the before, during, and after. So the customer experience, end-to-end -end customer experience, because this is where a lot, this is a huge challenge for a, for a lot of organizations and people is that to have a consistent, consistently positive experience from pre-sales through sales through post-sales to being the customer life cycle so because there's so many different touch points now it's very easy to drop the ball and to have a good experience followed by a bad experience and guess which one which one endures in your mind yeah no kidding yeah so it's, it's very true that? well for me it's it's usually when a client's talking to me uh we're at a resort uh, they might, everybody's aware what a ballroom is, but no two ballrooms are the same or situated the same, nor is the client set up. They might have audio visual, they might have a big stage presenter uh, and a huge stage with already teleprompters there and things like that. So we have to make sure what kind of environment are we going to be in? Uh, are they going to provide a separate power? Uh, how do they want us to, is there going to be a podium on stage for the speakers? You know, all these details that really make it a turnkey operation. And because I've been on the production side of it, I'm able to work out power, um, work out uh, the audio visual team. Do they want us to plug into their system or are we providing a system for our own selves? That's separate. All those things can, you know, make a big difference in that communication and of course the event and the experience. So that's just the beginning of it to the point where the contract is drawn. We all know what that communication is gonna be, how the setup is gonna be, who the audio engineers, contact points for the room, uh, is the speakers that are gonna be presented that evening, when's the band schedule, all that is provided uh, down to the point then the actual evening. And as we all know, uh, things change. Time frames change. The, the speaker might take longer. He might have a food pile in the audio. Uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen at the event. So those things change in live time and you have to be flexible, of course. And then there's the following up the feedback from the client. Could we've done more? Uh, could we did we already do over 110 percent? And they're so happy and ecstatic that it was a great experience that they're walking away with that and coming back for more. Those are mm -hmm. things that are really all the touch points that everybody should have right up to the final team, to thanking the event team. Um, yeah. You know, we make sure that everybody is in, involved in that thank you and that success has succeeded upon everyone. I, I like that point, actually, that just to touch on that one there, that's the last one you just made about thanking people. I think, I think politeness and gratitude is in short order. Uh, at the moment and I really do think and I think and it's a sad indictment to be honest that if you're polite and you're thankful and you show gratitude you will stand out today oh absolutely, absolutely. I think I think customer service is severely lacking right now for many organizations I do not understand it we weren't raised in that environment in business we come from the old school where the customer is always right you're always polite you never lose your temper and listen and you listen Mm. Yeah, listening is a, yeah. a very big one. Yeah, and that's why I think, as I said, I mean, people can put their bumper stickers on their website and say, oh, we put the customer at the center of everything. But if that's not your experience when you're a customer, it actually undermines undermines everything. But yeah, I love that. Uh, the, the, the gratitude and thankfulness, it's such an easy thing to do, but it makes such an outsized impact. I think maybe, uh, John, the, the challenge is that in order to do that, we have to be humble. And so there has to be a humbleness about, about your work and about your products and services. And so, you know, if you take that humble approach every single time, it, it will, it, you know, customers appreciate that. It makes yeah. them feel important and special. And let's face it, they are important and special. We can't do our work without them. And a lot of the times what we have found, we become extended family, just not a client to them anymore. It's, right. it's almost like you're part of their family and they think of you first. And when that comes into that realm, you're just not a product anymore. You're a brand and a trust bond that they can always depend depend on. Period. Yeah. I'll maintain your professionalism because you do need to make you do need to understand that you're, you know, there's, there's a, a line. There's a professional yeah. line still. Yeah, no, no, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great point is that you become a trusted advisor, you become a friend, but there is that line of professionalism, because sometimes, you know, you maybe have to have difficult conversations. It is. Oh, and do. sometimes we even become their resource. 
the next right. time they come through, they're like, you know, you, you, you provided a great service for us. Could you be a resource for us? We're coming back with a different group, a different environment. And this is what we would like to obtain in our goals. And we have no problems with difficult conversations because it's an opportunity for us to, you know, have an honest discussion with our client or consumer and, you know, either improve on what we're doing or, hey, we didn't think about that. You know, it, it just, we, we welcome that. We welcome it. We don't think yeah, of it yeah. as difficult discussion so much as, as an opportunity to, to learn. learn and grow. And I think the other part and the final one we'll, we'll just talk about, the other part is to do that, you have to you have to establish a, a trust relationship, but also a relationship of, of equals. You know, these are two people you're providing a service, they're consuming a service. And I think sometimes it comes from lack of confidence on, on the seller side. Uh, so when difficult conversations come up, they panic instead of saying, OK, this is OK. You know, this is what happens in these situations. We'll sort it out. Yeah, and every now and then it's even appropriate after, after we've listened to the client or the customer to actually educate them on, on mm -hmm. not necessarily why they're wrong, but why we might do something in a particular way. And this is the reason why. Especially since uh, Dean and I deal with different cultures uh, all over the world. So what might be perceived that we might perceive might not be the same way yeah. in another culture. Yeah. So you have to understand that. Yeah, and that's why open. I would say you got to you got to be careful about humor too. <laughs> oh, very careful. Extremely, extremely. Yeah, very yeah because good. we work with Fortune 500 companies, the U.S. State Department, and things like that. Uh, we always make sure that that protocol and etiquette is in place, and that there's a clear line of communication. And when we get it wrong, and sometimes we do because we're human, we have no problem apologizing. We have no problem setting it right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. Absolutely. Just own it, ownership. Of it, owning Absolutely. It is Absolutely. OK, well, this has been fantastic. All of uh, all of Dean, all of Dean and Don's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and about your book. Thirty thirty one cents to 43 countries. Oh, Hardcore so tips to increase in Thank you. There we go. There you go. It's right there, folks. Perfect. One cents to 43 countries. Hardcore tips to increasing profits. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. It's also available in ebook and audible for those that like to drive and listen. It also includes our music that tells you about the stories that uh, or on the trips that we've taken through the U.S. State Department and different entities, um, as well as you can find it on deospeaks.com. That's our speaking site. And then our band site is dinaprestonband.com, D-I-N-A. P R E S T O N band.com. And so we look forward to hearing from you. And if you learned anything today, of course, we'd love to hear a follow up with John and everybody else out there. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and be successful in your journeys. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And all of the, the books and the, the links will all be below this video. I think your next book should be Lost in Afghanistan. I think that's a great title. <laughs> it's actually in the book. It's, it's in the book. Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you need to make a movie out of it then. I don't know. We're, we're, that's Don's. That's actual. actually we we've been talking about that to make a docu series. Um, uh, so you know, it, it's it's definitely stories that will raise your eyebrows. But we also have tips and tricks that we teach you at the end of each chapter so you can actually utilize it to your business today and make it useful for you. This is a tool for everyone. And we honestly yeah. started with 31 cents. That's the yeah. title. Between the two of us. Yeah, we literally yeah between the two. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to ask you who contributed more of the 31 cents. <laughs> we did it in the book. Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, perfect. All right. Well, listen, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dean and Don. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening, watching, and I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Take you care, for having everybody. us. Thank you. Absolutely.